Wednesday. Uh, hi, I'm Anne. Hi, I'm Marie, and we are coming to you live from Austin, Texas, because it's Happy Woolen Wednesday! Wednesday! Hey, everyone, happy Wednesday. Thank you for being here. It's 2 o'clock. Time to hang out with you guys for a while. We are ready for fall. The temperature's barely dropping, right? Barely. Slowly but surely. But we're planning our <laughs> Halloween costume. So you guys thinking about what you're going to be? Where yeah. Tell Talk them what our theme is this year. It's uh, heroes or, or heroines. Yeah, heroes or heroines. So maybe we should have a costume contest in our Facebook group. Do you think? Oh, yeah. For everybody who posts your costume. Now some measure of it should be felted. I don't care. 10%, right? 15%. You guys got to felt some part. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. You got to felt <laughs> some part of your costume and post it online. Let's have a contest and we'll give away some stuff. What do you guys say? I say that sounds to great. Rocket orange ball. Okay. We're ready to get started. Are you guys? I hope you're here. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. And happy Wednesday. I'm going to queue up my system here so I can see all of you beautiful people. If you are joining us for the first time, we are Living Felt. I am Marie. We're here in Austin, Texas. And this is what we do on Wednesdays at 2 is hang out with our BFF, our best felting friends. Oh, I'll turn down my, my volume. Hi, Joanne. Hi, Kelly. Hi, Judy. Nice to see you all. Yeah, check in, say hi, and tell us where you're from. We have friends, of course, all throughout the United States. We have people usually joining us from Europe, from the UK, sometimes. I don't, it depends on what time it is where you are. And if you're watching later, feel free to go ahead and comment as you're watching. Then we can look back and see where you are and what questions you have, uh, what inputs you have as well. Our format is pretty open and pretty organic. Everyone contributes questions and we try and answer them. And you're welcome to chime in too while we're talking with your ideas and your contributions um, as we try and answer questions and tips and tidbits for folks. So thank you for joining us. And to kick us off, one of our favorite things to do is to say hi and give a shout out to our friends around the world. And so Hannah's gonna do a far and away report. Right, Hannah? Yes. <laughs> Hey everybody, how are y'all doing this week? So I'm back this week with our Far and Away report. Today we, or this week, it was earlier this week, we went to Queensland, Australia. So we're going to say hi to Monica in Queensland, Australia. It's 8,100 miles away and it would be a 23 hour plane ride. Now, I don't know how many of y'all out there have been on a 23-hour plane ride. I'm thankful I haven't, <laughs> but I'm sure it would be a beautiful place to visit. Rachel uh, says hi, Hannah. Hi, Rachel. <laughs> hi, everybody. Thank y'all. Thank you, Hannah. Always fun for us to check in with folks around the world and all our folks right here, too. So, Jane's in the UK. Kelly said hi from Switzerland. We're shouting out to Australia. We love you near and far. And hey, on that note, I want to tell you something. We have decided to do a BFF show and tell cam so that if you come to visit us, we always ask for show and tells. But bring a show and tell and we're going to do a video so you can shout out back to the community and share while you're here with us. So if you're coming, I know that Ashley Wyrick is due. Did you, I didn't tell you. Ashley, I know. Anne's looking excited. Uh, Ashley Wyrick is coming in, we think, next Tuesday. So maybe she'll be our first BFF cam unless uh, somebody else comes in before that. So... Ring your show and tells when you come. We can't wait to meet you when you're in town and give you a great big hug in person. And I just want to say hi to some folks. Hi, Connie. And hi to everyone. You know, thank you so much for your contributions in the group. It's so fun for us to see you all answering each other's questions and sharing your tips and ideas because we're not trying to be the mothership of all answers. We just want to be facilitators <laughs> in helping all of you all and all of us come together. So thank you so much for being here. Okay, I want to do a couple, we're going to do a couple of real quick uh, questions. We're going to try and knock out four things right away that you all have asked for that have been a bit of a repeat. So the first one is on our fairy tale pumpkin tutorial for wet felting. So the, this is, you all have seen this, most of you, the wet felted fairy tale pumpkins. This is a complex resist. And we have a free tutorial for this. It's free to download online. 
Some people have asked for a print version and we've made that available too. It's on really nice paper, the colors, the images are high resolution. But what I came to talk about is how to do this without getting a hole in the bottom. And that's what Sharon Denier asked. She has made a ton of these. They're so beautiful and we've posted so many of the complex ones and the simple ones from our felt along last week. And this is, I'm going to show you how to avoid getting a hole in the bottom uh, and tell you what happens. So this is the resist. It's a multi, it's called, some people call it a book type resist. So what we do is we actually felt over each of these little individual pages. And then when you take the resist out, you have, you know, this unstuffed, this is stuffed. So what's been happening is because of the way we wrap the fibers, some people have a hole in the top and the bottom. The, hole, the top is fine because you want to stuff it and add a stem, but I brought along my um, painter's tape <laughs> to show you how not to get the hole. So when you make your resist, it's going to look like this and it's sewn down the middle. When you put your fiber on, my blue painter's tape represents the fiber. So the first layer of fiber goes up and down and the second layer of fiber goes across and we do that around the whole template and then we do a design layer but here's what happens because you're felting over individual pages this fiber that runs this direction comes around this piece wraps around the bottom and if you do that sequentially on each page what happens is you don't cover this little base here so to avoid that what you do is at least, I'm going to say three to four times during the process, is refold your template so that you have half the pages on this side and half the pages on this side, and then wrap the fiber from front to back. And then after you go a few more pages, redistribute the pages on the bottom and wrap the fibers from front to back. And then the same. So just do that at a few different points where you actually redistribute the pages so that you're wrapping all the way around this resist. And that's how you will avoid getting a hole on the bottom. It's still going to be a little bit thin. You know, it might be a little bit thin or a little more um, bumpy because I'll try and show you this up close because you're putting so much fiber around each of the individual pages we cover each of these individual pages in two layers and then we add the design layer which is multiple layers so that's my hot tip for that does that help mm -hmm. yep she said good. that makes so much sense. oh good good okay so we knocked that one out the second one is for marta and marta has asked about doing whiskers and we've shown this before um but so this time i brought along herman to show how we do whiskers. And we do whiskers on animals one way is to use our horsehair, our horsehair fibers. So these are the three colors of horsehair that we offer. And this is light. And you can see that they're variegated. This is the medium. And this is the dark. So no matter which one you get, you're gonna get a, you know, a variety of fibers. And this is how much horsehair comes in a packet. So it's going to last a long time. But to demonstrate how to do that, Herman said that I could put regular thread. <laughs> I could put regular thread through his muzzle. So this is how I do it. And Anne's going to make sure that I'm all queued up here. Rather than using glue, I suggest that you sew all the way through. So notice, pretend that this black thread here, pretend the thread is the horse hair. And you can use yarn if you want. Up, oh, sorry. Take your needle all the way through the muzzle. Herman doesn't mind. He likes being on the show. <laughs> okay, hold that side and then pull that out. So you have this whisker, you have one whisker out of each side. Well then what you're gonna do is go back through the muzzle. Give me a second while I reload my needle. I only need my glasses to see far away, so every time I'm doing this up close stuff. So then we're just going to go back right through the muzzle and come out where you want and do this as many times as you want. And that's what, what we would do. And then you just trim these to the length you want. So now these two are both anchored. And they would, does that clear? Does that show up? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so these would pull out if somebody tugged on one, um, but really, that's why we say they're not toys, is because hopefully the kids, hopefully the, ki the kids aren't, you know, pulling them out. But I can pull on any one of these that might come out, but you could put them back in if one of your little grandkids or babies gets a hold of it. So that's it. That's my hot tip for doing whiskers. Does that help? Okay, Herman wants to go back on the pumpkin. <laughs> Herman's <laughs> got a new friend. Okay, that's two. The uh, the third one I'm going to do is for Cherie. Uh, Cherie asked, how do we put magnets on things, on uh, felted pieces? Because she says she doesn't like to use glue. This is our poinsettia. You can make one of these from our kit, or you could probably figure it out as well. But this is, uh, you know, a multi-layered flower. It's got the jingle bells. And we like to put magnets on these so that you can wear them or attach them to something. And this is what we do, Cherie. We make a piece of felt from the same fiber and actually sew them in. Does that show? Can you see this? So, so I sew them in because I'm like you. I'm not a super big fan of glue. So in this case, we stitched them on. And that's one idea. Some people... Um, some people don't like to use glue or any kind of thing that might, uh, you know, affect the surface of the fiber, and sewing is one way to do that. And speaking of glue, uh, Becky shares that when she does whiskers, she puts a tiny little drop of paper pull using a toothpick at the root of each whisker to keep oh, them from coming out. That's in. cool. So, yeah, so Becky is saying that she's, that she's going to put the paper pull right there. And we do sell paper pull, and um, we do sell paper pull. Or maybe she puts it on this side, but you could definitely put it on that side. We do sell paper paw, or you could also use glue, and I'm going to show some tips on paper paw later, later in the year, on working with that in your felted sculptures. Okay, cool. You're welcome, Sheree. Yeah, good. Okay, then my last one. These are my these are my Fast and Furious four. Uh, my last one is for Jeanette, and Jeanette asked how to separate locks and flick them. What are the tips that we have for them? So. Um, this is a flick carter. We sell this on the website and I brought in just some of our border lester locks. These are three colors. These white ones will be great for Santa. The green ones are part of our wild vine series which we've been putting in our fairy tale pumpkin kits, the needle felted ones, and this is part of our wildfire series. So when you have like a little cluster, when you have a little cluster of locks and they're sticking together, the best way to separate locks, no matter what type you have, if you can, is to find the natural tip. So if you can see that, that the natural tip is almost always going to taper or curl, whereas the cut end, the end that was on the sheep's body, is going to be more blunt and should be more flat. So when you want to separate locks while preserving the lock, find your curly tip. Find the tip hold on to the rest and just pull them out. So just find your way around to the curly tips and pull those out and they should separate pretty well. Now sometimes your locks are a little more matted uh, and not you know, quite as defined as these. There's all manner of locks in the world. But if you're trying to preserve them, if you go after them one at a time and pull the natural tip, that's going to preserve the lock structure the best. Is that clear? Okay, and then I want to show how to flick out the end. So she's asking how do you flick them out. Now this is, this is a tiny lock, and often spinners flick out the lock so that it gets fluffy it, um, if they're not trying to spin in the lock, but maybe they're even preparing the fiber to be carded. So the first thing is hold on to that natural tip that we just looked at. Hold the lock at about the halfway point, and hold it tight so that then you just take the flick carter and see how instantly that just fuzzed it all out and then you turn it over if you want to flick out both sides you might just want to flick out that side but if you want to flick out both sides you just do the same thing and that way now you have instant fluff and so if you're wanting to card those locks um, whether you're hand carding them or you want to just spin them from the fluff there you have it so grab half flick grab the other half flick questions not so far we did have a question earlier from Susan she says hi I was wondering when 
you are going to do the cuffs and bracelets that you wear. Yeah. I uh, really like them. Good Christmas presents. Oh yeah, that's that's great. Susan who? What's the last name? Rinchen. Thank you, Susan. Um, I actually have some great photos and we have some final things to do on that. So it's on my list to do. It's on my short, long list of things to finish up. So thank you for reminding me for that. And um, really in a Saturday, you can make a you can make a few, and in a weekend you can make a ton. So we'll do our best to get all those images. We have some images and video clips to put together and um, teach how to do that, and thank you for that. Alrighty, and we do have a question about the locks from Bobby Matthews. She says, is there a way to get them back into locks? No. <laughs> if you do that, you're not gonna get them back into locks. You won't, no, no. <laughs> What would be a great felt along? What's showing? Oh, the the locks, the the cuffs. Yeah, I, I think the cuffs would take would take too long. Meaning, there's too much. We're treating the cuffs. I did the I did a cuffs tutorial with my friend Erin Butler, and we treated it as a fun way to play with surface design. And so we're going to show you a few different surface designs in that cuff tutorial. But really, I just need to pull my stuff together and make that happen. Um, okay, so. We're going to move on and it looks like we had a few questions that just coupled right well together and those were from Sue Gray. She asked about the difference between the Angelina and the Firestar and the bamboo and the silk and when would she use each. And then um, Connie wanted to see some Angelina and Sharon wanted to see colors of hankies. So we're going to kind of like roll these three questions all together. Um, yeah, save some of those questions and I'll come back to them if you would. Okay, so I'm going to try and, um, and show some of these examples. This one's pretty hot, but let me see if it shows up. So these are all wet felted examples in this case, and this is Angelina felted in to the background. Does it show up clear enough, not blurry? Yes. Okay, that's Angelina. Here's a dark blue Angelina on the blue. Angelina is an art. Angelina is a polyester. It doesn't felt. You're going to have to trap it down with fiber, and it's very metallic, very metallic. So use Angelina if you want extreme bling. <laughs> That's like extreme bling, girlfriend. If you use Angelina, and it's wiry, it's going to kind of stick up off what you're doing. I'll show you a project next week where I worked in the Angelina, and I didn't, I didn't trap it down with. Uh, enough fiber to make it all lay down so I just had to trim it and I'll show that to you so you're gonna want to trap the Angelina down because it's straight it doesn't felt at all and it needs anchors going across it I thought I had enough but I put on a lot of Angelina <laughs> okay and then Tessa silk and bamboo will look similar but expect the bamboo fiber to be shinier let me show I know I had another example here I had something with whites oh right here okay so this is white, uh, this is white Tessa silk right there. That's white Tessa silk and notice how, it, you know, it just kind of squiggles out. You don't have to trap down the Tessa silk or the bamboo. This is also, uh, I think this is the bamboo right there. You don't have to trap it down. It's going to just migrate, the wool will migrate into it. Uh, so, but it's gonna add some nice sheen. So will the hanky. So here on my fairy tale pumpkin, right here, this is bamboo. Those are bamboo fibers. This white is bamboo. Does that all show up, Ann? Okay, this is bamboo, all bamboo. And then these textural things right here, these are hankies. These are hand dyed hankies. So use the bamboo and the tussa silk if you want sheen. But bamboo is shinier than tussa silk. Yes. And yeah. Sue Gray asks, can you wet felt the Angelina? You can, but Sue, look at these examples here. So here's the Angelina. This, this one's a good example because I use such two different colors. So the dark blue shiny is the Angelina and the turquoise blue on top is Merino top. So you can use um, more similar colors like this one and the cross fibers matting them down doesn't show as much same as here you can barely see 
you know, that I have fibers anchoring them down. But this one demonstrates that you really need wool fibers on top to anchor down the Angelina. Otherwise, it's going to look hairy. Those things will just stand straight up. So what you'll have to do is trim them down. So we're not carrying the Fire Star anymore, um, but the just treat the bamboo and the Tussa as similar cousins, the bamboo being shinier. Um, and then the Angelina is just that metallic, you know, more wiry. You, you can use little bits to add a little bit of gloss. And you can also cart it in to your fibers before you felt so that it's a little more integrated. Just like we did on our little, you know, our little guy here, we needle felted him in. And here I twisted them, like in the top of his horns there. I twisted it into the fiber before I needle felted it so it was already a little more trapped down. Um, even here along his belly with the neps. So if you can blend it with some fiber before you felt, it'll lay down a little bit better. Alrighty, and uh, Amberly Barnes asks, does it matter if you use heat or non-heat, Angelina? No, a Amberly, it doesn't matter if you use heat or non-heat. The heat, Angelina, just allows you to bind it to itself if you want to. So maybe you're making fairy wings or something, and you, uh, if you iron it, it will bond to itself. That doesn't make it bond to anything else. It just makes it bond to itself. So we sell it because it's like an added, an added funsy that you can heat, you heat bond it. Alrighty, and then yes. we had a couple people asking what is Firestar and asking about the difference between the Firestar and Angelina. Yeah, the Firestar, you know, I don't, I know that the Angelina is a polyester fiber and the, the Firestar, I actually don't know if it's polyester or what it is and we're, we're not carrying it anymore. So it just didn't seem to have that much interest. It's uh, metallic-y, but it's also, it's like a metallic integrated with an other fiber that sort of tends to emulate wool, but is not wool. And we've just decided not to carry it anymore. I think spinners have liked it. Um, I think spinners have liked it, but we just, we haven't found much use for it. So we're actually not carrying a Firestar anymore. But on the Angelina, I did, or on these, I did want to show you a few things so that Ann brought in. So I showed you those felted versions and Ann brought in these. These are um, two examples here. This is bamboo and it's indie dyed. All of our bamboo is indie dyed. So you're going to see um, some variegations in it. And all of our Tassa silk is commercially dyed and it are is solids. So these are both, what are these colors, Anne? <laughs> uh, the bamboo is moss. And oh, yeah. Is, is a leaf. Leaf, yeah. Moss, this is moss in the bamboo and leaf in the tussa silk. And then this is our, we call this Christmas green, right? This is our Christmas green in the Angelina. Bling, bling, bling. Woo, and that's a pack. This is one this is what what comes in one pack of Angelina right there. So it's it's like a lifetime supply, <laughs> unless you're a spinner, I think. It's a lifetime supply. Now, Connie asked to see the Forest Blaze Angelina, and she said it looks like a funny color on her screen, and we love it. We love it with greens, and we love it with earth tones. So this is Forest Blaze, and it has like coppery gold and green highlights do those show up at all on the camera Anne's trying they to do. see yeah coppery yeah. gold and green are the highlights <laughs> um okay so i'm going to set these aside and then we had questions about hankies and so uh for sharon's question about seeing the colors of our hankies. I'm gonna let Ann tell you. These are the colors of all our hankies that we carry right now, and Ann's gonna talk you through the names of each of those. <laughs> Thanks, Ann. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. We've got all of our silk hankies right here. Okay, so let's see. Is that good? Up a little bit. Perfect. Alrighty, wonderful. So we're gonna start right here. This is Ebony. Charcoal, mist, white, copper, cocoa, sun, saffron, pumpkin, garnet, shell, and lavender. And then the final row is kiwi, olive, seafoam, lagoon, glacier, 
and corn flour. Rachel says hi, Pam. Hi, Rachel. <laughs> All right, any questions? Yeah, they say pretty colors. I might say pretty colors. Yes. I love them. <laughs> mm. No. Let me see. Can hankies be wet felted on top of them? Do some nano felting on top of them or create a hanky like you would in your pocket? Oh, so are you using them for nano felting or do you make them into a hanky? For like handkerchief. Oh, okay. Um, you would just use them. They're ideal for wet felting. Um, like any non-wool embellishment, you'd want to anchor them down using wool. Um, let's see, I think Marie's grabbing an example yeah. of silk hanky. They don't, they don't really need to be anchored down, but you can. So you can to create, to change the texture. So this whole little uh, island here is a hanky, but then I ran some Dijon fibers across it, you know, just to break it up a little bit. So it will bind with the wool really well. Um, right <laughs> it'll bind with the wool really well so like this this right here this island is the same as that hanky i showed and we don't you don't have to put any wool on top but someone asked us who was it who was it who said that they had a difficult time with the hankies um was it connie yeah connie yeah. said uh she has a difficult time with the hankies and it's true because the hankies are these are silk cocoons that have been basically degummed and then stretched into onto a square frame so that they come shaped like this and then we sell a little packet which is uh, each of these is what you get in a pack this is what you get in a pack so this is a pack that's been folded up and um there's many in here we don't know how many there are what do you think there's like 20 in yeah we don't know I had someone tell me 200 once. When I was like, there's not 200. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but let me show you how to work with them. So they are very, 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 very thin. And you see all of these little layers here. If you peel them apart, you can see just how thin they get. And so the way to work with them, Connie said, how do you work with them so that they don't just end up in a big blob, which is how I like to work with them. But you can also stretch them out if you have any snags on your skin at all, they're going to stick to your fingers. So you kind of have to peel yourself out of them. And we actually work with these in our wet felting tutorial, our um, intro to wet felting, which is under videos here. Now, I don't think I can split this into one more, but I think that this is actually two hankies. I think it is. Anne agrees. This is actually two hankies. So the more you try and split it, the more it's going to lose its shape because once it gets down to that final piece, once it gets down to those final last two, they're really kind of combined. So Connie, you can take it like this and just literally lay it, you know, right down on whatever you're felting if you want. And you can also cut it. Um, you can also cut it to shape. But that's what I would say is peel back the corner. They're not all going to come off this square. But you can stretch this out, and you can even stretch this out. You could spin these if you spin, but you could stretch this out really thin and lay it across whatever you're felting. So, yeah, it is spider web. It is spider webby. Yeah, as Sue says, it's very spider webby, and it sticks to you. So it'll really stick to your wool too. That's that's a real plus. So um, I like to glob them on so that they really stand out because once they get super thin, they don't stand out quite so much. Alrighty, so we have a couple questions about the silk hankies. But okay. before we get there, Cece Smith shared that she puts a little lemon juice on her hands before working with the silk hankies and it makes them easier to work with. Really? Well, thanks, Cece. I'm going to try that. <laughs> I, I never heard of that. Thank you very much. I'm going to try some lemon juice <laughs> for better control. That's really awesome. <laughs> Good. Okay, Connie. Great. I'm glad to hear that. And then we also answered Sharon's questions, I think, which is approximately how many layers. There's at least 20 hankies, single hankies in there. Um, and we showed all our colors. And uh, Sharon is asking, uh, Sharon Denier is asking, do you ever sell variegated colors in the silk hankies? You know, we don't, um, and I'll tell you one of the reasons, hankies are, what we find is that dyed hankies are really expensive, and uh, variegated hankies, especially indie dyed ones, I've dyed a whole bunch myself, 
because I love them variegated, but I'll tell you that they're very resistant to dye. It's like this silk, it just has this barrier to the dye. So what happens is you have to soak them overnight and then um, dye them in little short stacks and apply the dye to the hankies and mash it in there and um, really saturate them in order for it to permeate even a thin stack of hankies. So we don't sell the variegated and where I have seen them, they're, they're expensive and for good reason. They take a lot of labor. So labor of love if you dye them yourself. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. And Leslie Lansing is asking, um, she says, you are using two terms, hankies and silk. What is the difference? This, these are silk hankies. We call it a hanky. This here is an un, is a degummed silk cocoon that has first they degum it and then a human actually unravels it and stretches it into this square. So this is a silk product called a hanky, whereas this stuff right here is combed silk top. So they're both silk. Okay. Okay. Good. And then Sharon asks, what dye would you use for dyeing silk hanky? We use the acid dyes. We use the acid dyes. You could also try the, the color hue, um, but the acid dyes are going to stay the best. So you're going to need high heat and vinegar and uh, the acid dyes. But that's what I use on my hankies. One last question on the silk hanky. Okay. Karen asks, do you felt the hanky longer than the wool? No, it just no, it's just all gonna felt down. You know, the one thing I tell people is like these when I did uh, when I do a project like this, this is very heavy bamboo and silk hankies on the outside, and the whole thing felt kind of slimy, <laughs> while even while it was once it reached a point of being felted. So it's gonna have a slightly different different feel, but no, it doesn't take any more time. The wool will migrate up through it, no problem. I think before we go any further, it's time to reveal the 900. Oh, the 900? The 900? You have to get Hannah. Okay. Yeah, okay. okay. So you guys want to know what this, oh, our numbers have fallen. Why is it 900? Maybe it's this. Maybe it's this. Maybe it's 090. Maybe it's O. Maybe it's 060. Does anyone want to get... <laughs> So Heather says, while I'm waiting for the gals, I'm waiting for the gals to come back. What are these colors in the basket? This here is cinnamon brown, and this is red grapefruit. So cinnamon brown and red grapefruit. So everyone wants to know what these big numbers are on the on the wall up here. Okay, gals, come in because everyone's gonna hold one. They can't see what what we're gonna do. Come here, stand right for a minute. Everybody got one. We're gonna try. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Does anyone want to guess what this is? <laughs> no? Not the number of views. My number right? So hold on. <laughs> 900 shows. No? I'm going to take two more guesses. You, you guys are, are responding faster than we can see. We got the slow poke, the slow poke viewers. 900 live shows. No? 900 secret agent <laughs> <Double assist. laughs> one more one more guess what is this 900 likes on facebook no in fact though i'm going to pause and add a little suspense we're almost at 10,000 likes on facebook oh my God. and we have never once ever done a like campaign i forgot to look back at it today so 900 pounds of wool no way more than that <laughs> way, more. way more than 900 pounds of wool in this house this you guys is the amount of money that you all and we all raised for the family in Houston. Let me get a try. <laughs> so I have to heart because I'm just going to cry. <laughs> $900 is how much our community gave to a family that they don't know who's trying to rebuild their home for their babies and their life. And so we just want to say thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> we're still seeing the we're still seeing the cute. So I'm gonna say thank you all so much for the, the contributions that you gave, whether they were good thoughts and prayers, uh, intentions, good words, cards that were sent in, hearts that were made, which we hope to share next week. 
and contributions, financial contributions from everyone. This is how much money we raised, and we just want to say thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank y'all. Hugs. So, we'll put it right back up. <laughs> Thank you. Hopefully it all stays. <laughs> I like that it's crooked. That makes it more fun. <laughs> I've been losing my voice all week, so I don't know why that is, but if you guys will just forgive that. I know, isn't that sweet? That's sweet, sweet, sweet. We really appreciate that. Okay, so we are going to jump to hats because so many questions, you guys always you know, pop in with uh, similar questions, and we're going to try and knock these out in the next few minutes. You all have asked so much about the hats. And actually, the question started with needle felting hats, I think it was. And Dee Dee said, hats, 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 uh, how to use the living felt hat form and the hat, what hat shapes can be created with it. Um, Sue posted that she used hers for the first time and said the longer she felt it, the bigger her hat got, and she didn't know why. Um, and then we have some other things relating to hats. Dee Dee also asked, how do you cut around brim? Um, how do you cut around brim? And so what I want to do is show a few hats. Um, I want to show a few hats. And before I show these hats, because I want to remember to do this, I want to just do a couple of show and tells. And this one is by Sue Ranbarger in Michigan. And she felt it this pretty, pretty orange hat. There have been more hats posted online in the last day or so, by the way. And she says she used our hat foam form, and she says she wasn't sure how to finish the brim, um, and thanks to everybody who shared their skills. So that's Sue in Michigan. And what I just love about this community is that, you know, barely, I swear, a few minutes went by before Ellen in Iowa is posting her tips and responses to Sue on finishing the edge. Compliments, of course, on uh, Sue's hat she gave. And then she says, occasionally she binds the edges and there are welted edges. She says, um, but that you have to plan in advance for that. So notice that she's, she sewed a little binding. Does that show up in the picture? She sewed a little binding. It's online if you wanna see it. So that's an option. We're gonna look real quickly at these hat forms. And then I got some great, great feedback from Steve and Aaron Whalen in Michigan. And I want to show, oh, Wisconsin, sorry. We get all my states mixed up. And this is one of Steve's hats that he made with our form. Does that show up? And what I want you to notice is how nice that edge is right there. Nice how that edge is. So after you cut the hat, you want to finish the edge. So let's look at some stuff with the hat forms and uh, and how we work with them. So uh, you don't have to turn it on, turn it just yet. I'm gonna I'm gonna hold these up at first. I'm gonna hold these up first, and then Anne's gonna turn our camera angle so that y'all can see. We're gonna do a quickie, quick, quick demonstration on the hat form. So this is uh, this is what our hat forms look like. This is needle a hat, a form for needle felting a hat. It comes in two parts and I'll show you why. And then this is the brim form, which is optional and separate. And what we do is we needle felt the hat over this form. If you just want it to be, what do I do with my, oh, if you just want it to be like this, it's just a roll up brim, just a roll up brim, then you can do this just over the form and the extension. If you want it to be short, you can just use this part. And if you want to use it on the hat brim, if you want to make a brim that goes out, it can be helpful to get a little more wool on there and you use this on top of the brim form. Or just this on top of the brim form if you want a shorter hat. So that's what these are designed for. That's how, this is how we use it. I'm going to do a quickie demonstration on how we apply the wool to this, and then we're gonna look at some hats. Um, okay, I don't know what, no, okay. So Anne's gonna turn us down here, and I'm just gonna show you really quickly how this works. Let me know when we're there, Anne. Oh, I'm gonna pull this out of the way first. Are we good? good. We're okay, good. so the first thing I wanna show you, especially if you're new, this is our MC1 batting. 
What we've decided we're going to do is make a hat uh, with this wool, but today we're just going to start and show you basically the, the principle of how this works. Um, and so this is our charcoal gray and this is our cinnamon brown. We're going to make a hat, at least planning to make a hat with these two together. Today we're going to start with the charcoal and this is a two ounce increment, which is pretty standard. And when you get it very often, it's one piece. What we suggest is go ahead and splitting the thickness and you can just kind of find the middle and tear that in half. This is folded over. What you'll notice if I hold it up, if I hold it here, is that there's a grain running this way. Even though it's a bat and it's all mixed up, there tends to be a grain. And if you pull along the grain, it's going to separate very easily. So you can continue to split this down if you want. And when you work with the hat form, what we suggest is go ahead and work in this half, at least this half thickness. And then when you're working with the brim, when you're working with the brim out here, let your wool come all the way to the outside. And I would tear this so that my wool goes like this goes around the form and out to the brim. You want the wool to go further than you need it. So the first thing we're going to do is run our layers up and down and go ahead and cross it. Go ahead and uh, cross your layers and then you're going to fill in all of your gaps. You know, I would do it more like this. I tear it off and I'll put this one on so that I'm filling in all the layers. And we're going to needle felt all the layers on this way all the way out further than you need the brim. You're going to needle felt that down and then you're going to run layers around. And this is an art, we have instructions for this on the website and with it. So then the layers are going to go around and you'll also want to do the same thing on the brim. When you choose your tools, this is the tool that's going to come with the kit if you get the advanced option. Or you could also use our the metal needle tool. You could also use a six needle tool, but I tend to use one of these fours. Are those show up clear? And just work your way methodically down so that you don't have any bare spots. When you finish with your hat, what is gonna happen, and who said, I'm sorry, who said they peel it off and it got bigger? That. I just read it. Oh, Sue ran by her. Oh, Sue. Okay, so Sue says hers got bigger. And here's what happens. Once you needle felt this hat all down, what we do is we peel it off, turn it inside out, and put it back on. So you're going to needle felt it really well on the form, and then you're going to peel it off and put it back on. And what happens is, this is a hat that was made on this form. Some of you will recognize it um, because it used to be a slightly different shape. What happens is you keep peeling it off the form and as you peel it, it stretches. When you're needle felting over the foam, really what you're doing is you're compressing the fibers more than you're shrinking them in. Like when you're wet felting, the fibers are going to just go into themselves more and then when you're needle felting like this, they compress more. It's a little bit different process. So it's because you peel it off the form, like four to six times. That's the reason I suggest running your first layer of fiber from crown to brim, up and down, so that as you peel it, those fibers are all running in this direction. Does that make sense? Okay, so it was asked, can you wet a hat after you've already you know, shaped it and then reshape it? You all might remember this hat. I shared it a few times. It was shaped more like this and had much sharper corners. But today, I wetted it for you. <laughs> I wetted it for you, and I even worked on these, these edges some, um, because what you want to do after you cut your brim is seal the edges down. But I want to show you that what you created is what we would call really a hood. It's more like a hood, and it's kind of a shallow hood, but we've created a hood that now we can put on a hat block. You can use your foam as a hat block if you want. Or you can use a wooden, a more of a traditional hat block like this. Put the steam on that. Or you could get a hat shaper 
We don't sell these. These are sold at hatshapers.com. We're always promoting them. They've been around a long, long time. I think this is made from like recycled tire rubber, or it used to be. It used to be. Anyway, they sell a boatload of these different types of plastic hat blocks, and they're made here in the USA. And this same hat could now be shaped on this hat form, which is what I did before. You don't need an expensive wooden hat block. You can wet felt onto this shape. You could use your, your fancy tools, whatever you have, and wet felt onto this um, and really get it to shape to this. But you can also block it with your steam iron. And so you can block a hat. You can iron right on it. I don't have any cloth down on my, my work surface, but if you're concerned about it, you can iron. I'm going to. My hat's not damp. My hat's not damp anymore. And I didn't really seat it straight. I just want to kind of start showing you that you can start to shape this. You can start to shape this to the hat form and get it. See how it's already lying down? We already went from a dome to a shape that's kind of lying down. And we can continue. You could iron right on the, the form. I've got my water coming out. You can iron the wool if you want to. If you're worried about burning any of your silk embellishments or anything, you definitely want to, you know, use a, a ironing cloth in between. But you can then block a hat after it's been made. You can, if you want this part, you know, you can wet felt to this. You can um, steam iron more to this shape. And while it's still damp, you can tie a band around it and wherever you tie that band, it's going to actually cinch the wool down and make it a little bit more snug there. It was asked how to um, cut the brim even, and I used this guy as my model for cutting on. I cut around this. You can make a chalk line around. There's some fancy cutting tools, and I'll tell you they're really expensive for milliners, but what you might do is make a chalk line um, around your form or maybe you make a shape onto a piece of paper and then cut around that. So yes, the ironing sue is going to really help smooth down that finish. I love ironing wool. Ironing wool, I'll spray the water right on there and I've taken pictures that were 100% needle felted and ironed them. What a cool effect that is. Even with like locks and textural elements on them. Now I said I haven't, um, I haven't really gotten this hat into position first. Ideally, you would not cut the brim first. You know, you would sort of get this shaped in first, but my hat was already cut. And I wanted to do this just to show you all <laughs> that it could be done. Now this is MC1 in Midnight Blue, uh, which is one of my favorite colors. and. You can just iron right around this form. So this is really going to smooth it out and tighten it up. And this hat was wet felted after it was needle felted. That's an important point. So I'm going to hold it up. This hat's been in and out of all kinds of places, but I'm going to hold it up so you can see that it's not super fuzzy. Some of this white stuff is just from it being hauled to and fro. <laughs> I've hauled it to and to and fro. So this is just a quickie, you, you can put that up now. This is just a quickie, quickie, quickie demonstration to show you all, to show you all that you can go from just a hood that you've felted over the form and then shape it more to a hat shaper like this or other hat shapers. You can also use fine fibers. You don't have to use our MC1 fiber. The lady, uh, the lady who invented the needle felting a hat form is Suzanne Higgs. Um, she's the person who introduced me to it when I very first started felting. And when she stopped making the forms, we started. She made them for a long time and then after a while she decided not to stick with it. And in the beginning we bought them from her. But she used fine fibers with her forms. and. Um, uh, she used fine fiber with her form, so you can use fine fiber as well. Someone had asked us before, why would you needle felt a hat instead of wet felting a hat? And I'll say, you know what, it's just preference. There's so many people 
who are a little timid about wet felting and needle felting is something they can sit down and do you know while they're in their living room it isn't messy and you can end up with a hat that looks not too far from this and then wet felt it just to final shrink it down and give it a nice finish so you can get really far with just the needle felting but for strength and smoothness, we will suggest that you go ahead and wet felt it. And it doesn't take that much. Um, you can't, you know, I suppose you can use Scotch Guard Patty, but I'll tell you the truth, I'm not that educated about Scotch Guard. I don't know how it would change the hand. I don't know what it smells like. I'm kind of inverse, averse to um, chemicals. So I'm not, I hope maybe someone else can ask, answer if they've used Scotch Guard. Um, yeah. Alrighty, we've got a few questions about hats. Mm -hmm. Barbara Scott asks, does it have to be pre-felt that you iron? Pre-felt? Does it have to be pre-felt or does it have to be perfect? I thought it said perfect. It said perfect and then she did a correction that said it was pre -felt. I don't know what that question means because this wasn't pre-felt. I don't know how to answer that question. Um, this was our MC1 batting that was felted. It was needle felted and then wet felted and then we ironed it. And then both uh, Sue Herbstreet and Anne Franklin asked, can you iron felted portraits? Yes, oh yes, I iron my felted portraits. All of my pet, all of my pet portraits get ironed, yes. Now, if you have dimension in them, so if they're not flat and you iron them, you're gonna mush out the areas that have dimension. So I wouldn't iron anything that you don't want that either isn't flat already or that uh, if it's 2D that you don't want it to mush out. Because if you iron something that has dimension, you're gonna smash it flat. Yeah, it will spread out. Uh -huh. and, uh, Linda Broderson asks, how much wool do you need to make a felted hat? Yeah, these are about, oh, you know what, we're gonna weigh this one. Did, will you weigh this one cut? We, you know, with our basic hat kit, we suggest at least four ounces. This one's probably three, probably three something. And then if you want to go for a brim, when you're doing this method, when you're doing this method, the hats tend to be heavier. Um, and that is because, as I said, you're just compressing down and you need all the layers, you need all the layers stacked on top of each other. So when we use our MC1 batting, it's usually the hats weigh around four ounces, maybe a little bit less. And then with a brim, I'm gonna say have six on hand at least, more like five. How much did that one weigh? 3.6. Okay, so this one weighed 3.6, but keep in mind that was after it was cut. So that 0.4 went away from the cut brim. Now when you're wet felting a hat, and my, um, I don't have any of my lighter weight ones here today, you can go much lighter because the wool shrinks in, or you know, however you're thinking about, the wool shrinks in, and you can have a hat that weighs, some of my hats started out you know, this big on a resist and were only two ounces. That's because the fibers all migrate towards each other. But this process, because we're just compacting down, you need all the wool stacked on top of them and top of each other, and that makes them a little bit more thick. So this tends to make a little bit of thicker hat, a little heavier hat. And uh, Daniela Aubrey asks, would I be able to custom order custom order a size? Um, um, oh, wait, I think she's talking about hat hat uh, forms. She says you can't find any forms that fit newborns from zero to 14 days. Oh, you know, um, we're willing to look at the dimensions for that. Um, we just are coming out of a production run, and it's probably our last production run of foam for the year. I can't say for sure, um, but we do do foam. We do foam production runs several times throughout the year, and we definitely will look at smaller sizes. We currently make uh, an infant form, and um, if you've tried that already and that's too big, let us know what you think would be better, because um, we can gang those up with our normal production run, but we can't do a standalone production run because our production runs are pretty large, uh, pretty large volume. But if you are looking for something that we don't carry, email customer service, let us know what those dimensions are that you're looking for, and we'll definitely consider it. Um, and I, you know, I had one more thing on the hats that we really ought to do. Is Sonia on here? 
Or is she gonna watch later? I have not seen Sonia. Sonia asked, how does she how does she iron an item without burning herself? And said that she burned her arm when she was um, ironing a hat. And Sonia, this is really important, so I hope you're watching. We consulted the experts and asked them what their guidance was, and they came back with this really special tool, and we think that you might have one already. Or maybe it's this hand you need it on while you're ironing. So we can't figure out how you burned your arm, but we love you, girlfriend. We're sorry about that. Maybe an oven mitt will help. I do want to offer a couple of more things for, um, I want to offer a couple more things on the felting hats. And that is, uh, someone asked how to cut a brim round. And I reached out last night to Aaron and Steve Whalen, uh, and I showed you Steve's, Steve's hat earlier, and they made the blue hat that Ian always wears around. Um, and they offered such great advice on brims, but they were more speaking to wet felting hats. And I'm gonna load this up to the files in our group because it's such valuable information. And I wanna tell you that um, they did suggest a couple of tools. I'm not including those because they're just so expensive. I think they're a little outside of our group scope. Um, really, I think the cheap one is 100 pounds. It might be 80 pounds, but before, yeah, before taxes, and then the other one is hundreds of dollars. That's not the one, they didn't suggest the one that was hundreds of dollars. But I wanna just verbally tell you a couple of things that they said. Um, when they wet felt hats, they said that when they're wet felting over a resist, they don't wrap the wool all the way around the bottom. Um, instead, they work the brim from the very beginning and take time to keep the edge straight. And I know Dawn does that too here. Dawn like, really is just the master of those edges while she was wet felting. And they said, um, they gave some tips on keeping it straight and rolling it, so I'm gonna upload those. They said they'll trim the, they're not afraid to trim the edge if they have to, but that you have to heal it, and that's what we were talking about. After you cut an edge, you have to felt it down, um, and that's what, that's what you'll do. You'll take that cut edge, this, this one is thick, but it's still been healed and it's no longer blunt. So you've got to heal those fibers from a really blunt cut to get them smoothed around that edge. So after you cut, you want to felt those edges. And then they said, um, they said, we know that people fold aggressively at times to get proper shrinkage. And while this may help shrink the hat down to the desired size, aggressive fulling such as throwing or shocking with whole cup, hot and cold water can result in unevenness, which we know because we talk about that all the time. So you have to think about whether you want that effect before you choose that fulling method. And they said to eliminate or reduce the need for aggressive fulling, we try and calculate the dimensions of the template as accurately as possible, and they spend more time felting to the shape they want, that it takes longer, but they think it's real worth it. And Steve has like really been studying millinery a great deal over the last year. Um, so these are these thoughts are coming after that experience of having wet felted a bunch of hats and then also been doing a bunch of really nice fine millinery hats. So I will upload their comments and thank you so much, Erin and Steve, for taking your time out last night, letting me knock on your door and ask you questions and provide that input. Your expertise is really um, appreciated. Thank you for that. Okay. Do we have time for a couple of quick wild cards? Okay, a couple of quick wild cards, Anne says. We're at 2.58, <laughs> so we're going to try and squeeze them in. Okay, the first is uh, Pam Golding is mm -hmm. joining us for the very first one. Hi, Pam. Podcast. And she asked about our MC1 stand, and she said that she hears our MC1 is to die for. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Pam. <laughs> MC1 is just an awesome... Would you grab Stash, since she's new? Um, MC1 is a really fun fiber to use. This is sand, which is one of our skin tones. We have several skin tones, and I'll just drop a seed and tell you that we have more on the way. Not today, not tomorrow. It'll be here before you know it. This is sand, thank you. Um, this is sand, it's just designed as a real neutral base tone that you can add color to, whether that's depth uh, or color, you know, cheeky cheeks, blushy cheeks, or darker tones, and this is stash. He is made with um, sand. So this is one of the skin tones that we offer. So I hope you'll try it. It's fun to work with. We have darker tones 
as well and we have currently one lighter shade and as I said more on the way which I know some of you are excited about what is another question alrighty and then Linda asked uh, what is the glassite detail kit and what is it used for? Oh, Linda Broderson? Mm -hmm. Oh, Linda, the glassite detail kit, you know, we've had this around a long, long time and we sell a lot more glass eyes now than we used to. But the glassite detail kit is sort of like a quickie way, maybe if you're making a bear or a dog or a little critter, and it's just sort of like a quick, here you have everything you need to get some glass eyes in the critter. So what we're going to give you are two, uh, two colors of glass eyes. They're on a loop back, so they would actually be sewn into your animal, and a doll needle to sew those in with, so a long needle. Then the eye colors are just brown and black. It's a standard pack. We're going to give you MC1 white and black for the eye, and then we're going to give you both sewing thread and waxed floss to sew those in. So what you'll want to do is make a nice inset for your eye with using like your 36 needle or your 32 triangle and then sew the eye in. You can sew it like through the back of the head if your piece is needle felted well. Sew it really, really tight. And whether you choose to use the button thread or the wax floss, you just want to tie really hard knots in the back and then come back through the eye socket. So we don't really have a tutorial for that per se, um, but that's what you'll do is you, you would sew those in. And do we so. have time for one more question? And wants one more question. <laughs> one more question. <laughs> All right, Vicki Ryan asked, when can we expect to find the workshops coming up oh. to be listed on the site? My husband has agreed to let me attend. Yeah. Will you even drive me? Vicki, wow, that's exciting. Well, I have on my, my notes here today, uh, workshop, coming soon, workshops online. So I had hoped to have them up already. We're taking care of a few more things, and I want to say that by next week, this time, Wednesday, we should have the workshop registrations available for you. That includes the, you know, whether you want to do the deposits or you want to do a full pay, we should be set up for that, at least for the workshops that we have on the calendar. Um, so that is March, April, May, and June, right? That's what we have scheduled, March, April, May, and June. So thank you for asking that, and we're excited that you're going to come. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good. Y'all, it's been so much fun. So we're going to give away some prizes. The girls are going to come back. I feel, I feel like we're forgetting something, but I guess we just covered so much, huh? We did. <laughs> it's been an action-packed hour. So thank you all for making it so fun. We're going to pick some prizes right now. All righty. Hannah gets to go for it. Hannah always gets to pick the first prize. <laughs> all righty. We got... C.C. Smith? Yay! Yay. C. 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 What does she win, Anne? Alrighty. Bag, we always start with bag number one. <laughs> we do. <laughs> Alrighty, bag number one is an assortment of embellishment fibers. We've got one Tessa silk. Uh, this, is, this is Kiwi. One silk hanky. This one here is olive. And then one uh, bamboo top. And this one is moss, as I showed earlier. <laughs> Yay! CC, so you can pick any colors you want. We have one test of silk, one bamboo, and one silk hanky. And those are for probably your wet felting adventures, for sure. <laughs> oh, that's good. Nice oh, he's all right. Okay, we're going to pick the second one. Me? Okay, I get to pick bag number two. Whatever, whoever. Bag, your bag number two. <laughs> Bag number two is Tracy Edwards. Yay, Tracy, congratulations. You have won, Anne's gonna show you. <laughs> it is a uh, critter detail kit. We've got one of the Primo clay. Uh, <laughs> one of the horse hair. And then one each, one pair each of the four millimeter and seven millimeter glass eyes. Yay! All right, Tracy. So you can choose, you know, of the horse hair, there's three colors. Choose which one you want. Uh, same with the Primo. Like if you want a white for teeth or black for claws, whatever color you want. And the glass eyes too. So four millimeter and seven. Just email customer service. Whatever colors you want. Okay, time for the last prize, last prize. Last prize. <laughs> Dee Dee Atkins. Yay, Dee Dee. Tell her what she's wanted. Alrighty. Prize number three 
is, I don't know if I can hold all this, <laughs> a needle felting a hat kit <laughs> with the four needle wooden tool and the brim. <laughs> so it's a big one. Dee Dee, so I don't know if you already have this, but this is just a full complete, it's beyond the needle felting a hat kit. So if you want to try your hand at this, you've won this with six ounces of wool, right? Mm -hmm. So six ounces of fiber, that's definitely enough to needle felt the hat. Oh look, and they picked the colors that I'm doing my hat in. Her hat's going to be prettier, I know it. <laughs> Thanks you all so much for spending an hour with us. We appreciate you. I hope you have a great day. And hey, help! thank you for helping us raise this $900 for our, I can't put it up there. <laughs> For this, can, this uh, our friends in Houston. Thank you so much. You guys have a Thank great time. Bye. See you next week. Bye. Be good to yourself. Heart, heart, heart.